speak to you. Leviticus uh, chapter 9 this evening. Sunday nights we make our way through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. As we come to this place in the book of Leviticus, the theme of which is a theme of holiness, God had spoken to the children of Israel upon coming out of the land of Egypt uh, related to uh, a whole kind of system for worshiping Him, a tabernacle that was to be built, uh, an entire uh, furnishings that were to fill that tabernacle, all of which uh, speaks of Christ, and then a sacrificial system that He was establishing as a part of this shadow of, of Jesus who was to come. But in order for these sacrifices to be offered on behalf of the people and, and all, it required a priesthood. And again, this priesthood, it's all about Jesus. It's all a shadow or a, a type or picture of Him in the Old Testament. And so, in chapters 8 and 9, what we have in Leviticus is the public kind of ordination uh, or consecration of the Levitical priesthood or the Aaronic priesthood. All of the priests came out of the lineage of, of Aaron, and so they were uh, descendants of Aaron. That's why it's called an Aaronic priesthood. And so uh, he's, we're stopped right in the middle of this as God is taking and uh, the launching of this priesthood is so important uh, to the Lord, again, as a picture of Christ. He wanted it to be a very public event. All of the children of Israel uh, are called to come and witness this consecration. They have come in chapter 8. Uh, sacrifices and offerings have already been made as a part of that consecration. And now in chapter 9, uh, the Lord is ready to present them uh, to the nation of Israel kind of complete. So the sacrifice has been offered. They've spent an additional seven days uh, in the tabernacle as a part of this. This, uh, waiting period before they would be kind of publicly launched, so to speak, and uh, seven being a number of completion in the Bible, uh, seven days constituting a week, the week of God's creation, and then his day of rest, seven colors in the rainbow, seven notes in the scales, and, and also it, it represents completeness, and it represented these priests, their total consecration to the Lord, to his work. So that's what's happening, chapter 9, verse 1. And it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. So at the end of this seven-day period, and he said to Aaron, Take for yourself a young bull as a sin offering and a ram as a burnt offering without blemish and offer them before the Lord. And to the children of Israel you shall speak, saying, Take a kid of the goats as a sin offering and a calf and a lamb, both of the first year without blemish, as a burnt offering, also a bull and a ram as peace offerings to sacrifice before the Lord and a grain offering mixed with oil for today the Lord will appear to you. God has given them a very long series of commands that they were to obey uh, in this ordination of, of the priesthood. They have obeyed these things to a T. And so God is very pleased with what they're doing. Our obedience allows Him to bless us even more, give even greater revelation in our lives. And, and this is what is happening. So Moses declares this is all very very, very good. God's going to do something special uh, today in appearing to you. So they brought what Moses had commanded before the tabernacle of meeting. And all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. So they obey these commands. And then Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commanded you to do, and the glory of the Lord will appear to you. And Moses said to Aaron, Go to the altar, offer your sin offering and your burnt offering. Now something, a, a gigantic thing happens in verse 7, and uh, it's, it's certainly very easy to miss it. At this point, Moses has been offering all of the sacrifices. And th at this point now, he turns all of that over now to Aaron and to his sons. So the sacrifices are now going to be officially start to be offered by Aaron. Now he tells Aaron the first uh, offering that he's going to offer, uh, and in his uh, capacity as high priest, as in, in his public capacity as a sin offering, uh, constitute, it was a sacrifice of a bull. Now you think a little bit about Aaron's past, remember? 
where he was uh, kind of the, well, he's the golden calf guy, you know, that kind of led the children of Israel into this whole idolatry and all. Now he's going to sacrifice a bull for his own sin, and, and uh, maybe he looked back on that. Listen, chapter 9, all, this whole section is a, is a picture of God's grace. I mean, the average person... Uh, and uh, maybe, uh, and certainly the average God, if there was such a thing, uh, would have been done with air and back at the golden calf thing. That's enough. Are there any more boys in this family? You can't, I can't turn anything over to that guy. I mean, you get the boss out of his sight and he's got the whole nation uh, dancing naked in front of the golden calves. What are we going to do with somebody like this? And yet, what does God do? He takes it. Aaron learns what he needed to learn from that experience. And God holds on to him and God's calling on his life to become the high priest, first high priest, the nation of Israel. And it's all a picture of the fact that God really is a God of second chances and third and fourth chances. We don't use that as an excuse to sin, but we recognize that to be true of him. It is tremendous. And I think nobody more than Aaron realized, I can't believe that he's turning this over to me. I can't believe he is entrusting this to me in, in the light of my past and in the light of my very public past. And yet God d- did, and God does. He is a very, very gracious God. Perhaps there's an amen for that here tonight. Yes, he is, isn't he? We know for sure. So Moses said to Aaron, go to the altar, offer your sin offering and your burnt offering, and make atonement for yourself and for the people. Offer the offering uh, of the people and make atonement for them, as the Lord commanded. Therefore, Aaron therefore went to the altar and killed the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. So again, this would be a repetition, uh, a repeated offering that the high priest would make throughout history, uh, a, a sin offering for himself, always that recognition that he was, however, you know, kind of elite his position was among God's people. He was just a sinner ministering to other sinners. So it was a way of keeping them humble and conscious of of that fact not to condemn but to keep our our feet firmly planted on the rock who is is christ and then the sons of aaron brought the blood to him and he dipped his finger in the blood and he put it on the horns of the altar and poured the blood at the base of the altar but the fat the kidneys and the fatty lobe from the liver of the sin offering he burned on the altar as the lord had commanded moses and the flesh and the hide he burned with fire outside the camp and he killed the burnt offering and Aaron's son presented to him the blood which he sprinkled all around the altar. Then they presented the burnt offering to him with its pieces and head, and he burned them on the altar. He washed the entrails and the legs and burned them with the burnt offering on the altar. Then he took, then he brought the people's offering and took the goat, which was the sin offering for the people, and killed it and offered it for sin, like the first one. And he brought the burnt offering and offered it according to the prescribed manner. Then he brought the grain offering, took a handful of it, burned it on the altar besides the burnt offering of the morning he also killed the bull and the ram as sacrifices as peace offerings which were for the people and Aaron's sons presented to him the blood which he sprinkled all around on the altar and the fat from the bull and the ram the fatty tail which covers the entrails and the kidneys and the fatty lobe attached to the liver and they put the fat on uh, the breasts and they and he burned the fat on the altar but the breasts and the right thigh Aaron waved as a wave offering before the Lord as Moses had commanded all of this we have seen in recent weeks with its imagery and then Aaron having done all of this uh, obeying God's word to a T then Aaron lifted his hand toward the people I mean he's so excited you can imagine I mean here it is and he's being used by God and he's pointing people to the Lord and so he lifts up his hand toward the people and he blessed them and uh, just pronounced God's blessing upon them came down from offering the sin offering the burnt offering and the peace offerings and then Moses and Aaron both 
went into the tabernacle of meeting and they came out and then together they pronounced a blessing upon the people. Must have just been fabulous. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all of the people. And here's how that glory appeared. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. This great fire. I don't know if we came from out of the, the, uh, the Holy of Holies there in the tabernacle or down from heaven itself and it consumed these these sacrifices are being burned even at this time being consumed some portion of them still on the altar God comes in and he makes quick work of it by by just demonstrating his presence through this uh, this fire consumed it the burnt offering the fat on the altar and as you might expect when all the people saw it they shouted <laughs> and then they fell on their faces now that's a way of saying that they worshiped the Lord it wasn't uh, so you've got this beautiful beautiful picture here in, in the people in their response wonderful combination of great joy I mean this didn't happen just every day here is God demonstrating his presence demonstrating his favor uh, in, in this way. This was a public um, kind of endorsement by God to all of the nation of Israel that um, he accepted Aaron as high priest. He, this uh, whole uh, Aaronic priesthood was something that pleased him. He accepted his sons. He accepted all of this. So it was a very uh, public way of demonstrating his favor uh, upon all of this. They saw it and it was just awesome. I mean, you just didn't see this every day and they just fell down and, and worshiped the Lord. So beautiful combination of joy and, uh, and holy awe. So we end here in chapter 9 and uh, it's one of those God moments. I mean, just one of those things that, you know, if you could put it in a bottle and make it happen every time uh, God's people came together, you'd do it. And here is a situation where they have obeyed God to a T. God has favored to bless them in this way with His presence. And um, God is blessed by what's happening. The People are blessed by what's happening. It is terrific. It's just so sad that there's a chapter 10. Because there's two people that don't understand what's happening here. And uh, they're going to mar things uh, a, a little bit. And so we head now into uh, chapter 10. And then, in the middle of all of this, Nadab and Abihu, and here we're told who they are, the sons of Aaron. They are two of, of Aaron's four sons. So they are priests. And uh, each of them took his censer and put fire in it and put incense on it and they offered profane, I think it's better in the old King James, they offered strange fire before the Lord which the Lord had not commanded. So now here's this great thing, God is the center of attention and every God is pleased, the people are giving him their full attention, they're blessed by it and then Nadab and Abihu jump up and decide to do something on their own to take the attention of the people off of God and to put it on, on them. And so they spoil uh, all of it. And, uh, and it's interesting that God takes and he records this in his word. I mean, he could have jumped over it and said, well, we'll just kind of uh, forget that that happened. But he doesn't. He includes it in his word, I think, because the same temptations to do the things that Nadab and Abihu did exist uh, within our hearts today. And there, there are ministry lessons and Christian life lessons that are found. I think there are at least six that are found in what they did wrong and what we must be on guard about in our own worship of the Lord or in our own service uh, to the Lord. So this is a very, very, chapter 10 is one of the most sobering passages in, in all of the Old Testament. And it's included, I think, because God wants to teach us some very priceless lessons. I wish everything in the Christian life was uh, all lessons that we learn were just like positive lessons 
You know, you just saw something done right and you learn from it. But so much of what we learn is where we see we either do something wrong or we watch somebody else do something wrong and then we deal with the repercussions of it and then we realize, okay, that's a way to learn too. Not the best way to learn, but it's a way to learn. And so we get to, and the, the best way to learn anything is to learn from someone else's mistake, especially when it's in the Bible and it's 3,500 years ago. It's not your, you know, it's not Aunt B or someone that we love so dearly and they've made a terrible mistake. But so this is what we get uh, to do. They took their censer, we're told there in verse 1, and a censer was just like a kind of a, a pan. It was a metal pan with a lid on it. And you would use it for transporting the coals from a fire over here or somewhere. You'd transport those coals then to another location. And it was kind of a holy way of, of transporting uh, coals. And so they took, each one of them took their censer. They put incense on it, we're told, and they offered profane fire before the Lord, then very, very important, which he had not commanded them to do. Now, the problem with all of this is that rather than taking coals, God had said, if you're going to take coals and you're going to offer incense uh, to me, number one, the coals always had to be taken from the bronze altar. Uh, from the brazen uh, altar there in the, the courtyard of, of the tabernacle. That's where, that's where it was always supposed to be taken. They somehow, we don't know where, but they obtained coals from some other place, some unauthorized, unacceptable place, and uh, from some profane place, some strange place, some secular place outside of, of the tabernacle there. God had, the, the law had commanded that only the high priest was to burn incense on coals taken from the brazen altar. And so they're, they're blowing through a lot of things here, uh, commandments of God. Only the high priest was to do that. Their father was the high priest. So they're taking on authority that, that they shouldn't have taken on to themselves. And then, and then they're not taking the, the, uh, the coals from the proper place. So they, they take and they decide, all right, we're going to do whatever we want. I'm gonna, we're going to supply our own fire from a source of our own choosing and as we're going to see in a moment uh, God uh, clearly is not happy with it and, and, uh, and, and rejects it now this is pure disobedience on their part uh, don't ever view this as like um, boy the poor guys they got out a little bit ahead of themselves and didn't know what to do and, and all they, they knew better than this this wasn't an innocent mistake that they were making here they're very familiar with the law they had considerable experience uh, with the Lord, uh, with their father going even up on Mount Sinai to a, 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 the highest place that anyone went other than Moses who went up to the top to meet uh, with the Lord. One of the problems in taking the coals from a, a foreign strange place, a, a strange fire, rather than uh, taking the coals from the bronze altar in, 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 in this uh, problem with their uh, actions here in attempting to approach God, what they're trying to do is approach God independent of the brazen altar, independent of sacrifice. And uh, as we've seen in Exodus chapter 27, uh, the brazen altar, the bronze altar, when you would walk into the courtyard of the tabernacle, the first thing, you're, you want to make your way to the tabernacle that was at the end of the courtyard. I mean, you are wanting to draw close to God, but you could not draw close to God without first approaching the brazen altar. And the brazen altar was where the sin offering was offered. You cannot approach God without our sin being addressed. And that's what the brazen altar uh, symbolized. So when you would go there to seek God, there's the brazen altar. It, remained, it reminded everyone that God could only be approached by sinful man on the basis of sacrifice. Sacrifice for sin. Sin can't be ignored. It had to be faced. It had to be confessed. had to be addressed. had to be dealt with. Sin can't just go away by trying to ignore it. Sin is a terrible thing in God's eyes. It's hated by God. His wrath must come upon it, the Bible teaches. Salvation is necessary. Now here's what Nadab and Abihu, the bigger thing that they're doing is they're spoiling the picture of the brazen altar as a picture of Christ and as a symbol of Christ because the brazen altar is a symbol of the cross of Jesus Christ 
Because the cross is, is, speaks of his sacrifice and, and where through his sacrifice he made the full and satisfying payment for our sins. And he's the one and only that sacrifice allows us to go into the holy of holies into an intimate relationship with, with God. Now here, here's why the, all of this is significant and why I spend time on it. The, the New Testament equivalent of Nadab and Abihu would be those who claim to represent God today, but teach that there's another way to approach God other than through Jesus, other than through sacrifice, and specifically His sacrifice upon the cross at Calvary. There's some other way for man to be saved and enter into a relationship with God other than Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. There's a lot of people saying that out there today. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I, I don't know, I don't know how you, you get better clarity than that for people. But people are saying, you don't need everybody to all the past and all these things. And then claiming to even represent Christ and all. And you look at what Nadab and Abihu did here, the very same kind of thing, bypass the sacrifice, even to bypass the type. People that are teaching this today are trying to bypass, they're doing the greater sin. They're, they are trying to bypass the substance. They, they just marred the type in the Old Testament. And yet the judgment, as we're going to see in a moment, they're going to be devoured by fire. And this passage tells us a lot about the future judgment of God that awaits those that claim to represent God, but teach that there's any other way to approach God than through Jesus. Jerry Falwell's gone on to be with the Lord now. I didn't know a whole lot about Jerry Falwell except I'd see him once in a while on, on TV and, and all. I didn't catch him teaching a whole lot sometimes, but, um, but I, I catch any time I'd see him on Larry King or some kind of a show or whatever deal it is, he would never back down on the fact that salvation was through Christ alone. EJ, they'd try and pin him and corner him and make him sound like an ignorant, narrow person and pose the questions every way to trap him, and you couldn't get that guy to move. And, and he was faithful, and I always appreciated that uh, about him. And, uh, but not everyone stands that, that strongly. I'll tell you, I wouldn't want to be any teacher today claiming to represent Christ or representing the God of the Bible who, who says there's another way other than, than Jesus. Not for all the popularity in the world, not for all of the acclaim or everybody thinking a, a person is wonderful or what, not worth it at all. You know, what my, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible for kind of uh, maintaining a backbone on these kind of issues for me is Galatians chapter 1. And I think about the Apostle Paul there and and he declared uh, to the churches at Galatia, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. He said, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a servant of Christ. You know what we want to hear one day concerning our lives? Well done, thou good and popular servant. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what we're going to be rewarded for. Is, is faithfulness. I think sometimes people wonder there's so much error that's just being taught and, and, and nobody even blinks at it hardly uh, anymore. Sometimes people wonder why God doesn't judge this kind of deliberate false teaching uh, immediately today. And, and he's given us the reason in, in the scriptures. And the reason is, is he says, I'm going to deal with it in the future. I'm going to deal with it in the future. James chapter 3, verse 1. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers or claim that you represent God and teach His Word and all, knowing that we shall receive the stricter judgment. I think in light of the, the great displeasure of God displayed here against Nadab and Abihu in misrepresenting God and, and handling the things that here, just a type of, of Christ, I wouldn't want to be on the receiving end. 
of, of the judgment that's going to be meted out for misrepresenting God concerning his son, uh, Jesus himself. No, thank you. It's a big deal to speak for God. Better stay close to the book. Sometimes people say, Pastor, thank you for, you know, staying with the Bible and sticking with the Bible. And you know what? I appreciate that encouragement. But one of the nice things about God's call upon my life, I have plenty of flaws, trust me. Um, But one of the things is, I don't have a song and a dance. None, None you'd want to hear or see. I don't have any other option but to try and stay true to the Bible, stay with the Bible, try and bring that truth forward. So God help us here. So lesson number one from this incident, we are not free to approach God on the basis of our choosing. We approach God on the basis of His choosing, and we are thankful for that. And if a person isn't, man, buckaroo, you are so lifted up in pride, you can't even believe it. Be thankful that God has provided a way of salvation for the likes of you and I. If you think you're something, we'll just ask God for like a 40-year video of your life, and we'll see how tremendous a person you are. Now, we're all about the same, and uh, desperately in need of a Savior, should be thankful that God has made a way of salvation for us. Lesson number two here is we are never ever to elevate man-made ideas and theories about ministry and the worship of the Lord above what God's Word commands. And that's what this was, this whole strange fire thing and profane fire. They're just, they were just man-made ideas. They thought they knew better than God. God said to do it this way. It's so narrow and so ridiculous. I mean, we're smart. I mean, He gave us a brain, didn't He, and, and all. I, I like that word strange as it's used here because uh, I think it conveys the meaning better. And the Hebrew word for strange or profane there, it carries the idea of being strange or a stranger. And, of course, a stranger is someone who's not a part of the family. They're cut from out, they come from out there, out in the world, right? So in the same way, they offered a fire that didn't come from God, but it came from out there in, in the world. And again... I, You see an awful lot of strange fire being introduced into Christianity today. Strange doctrines and practices, they have their origin in in man's fanciful ideas, even pagan religion, uh, the culture that we're in the middle of, and and, uh, all of it being introduced into Christianity. And all, all, so many of, of, of them, man's ideas and man's cleverness. You say, where's that in the Bible? They say, well, it's not in the Bible, but it works. That's the mantra today. Excuse the use of the term mantra, please. But that, that's the whole thing, is what works. But what does it work toward? Making a big church and having a lot of money? That's not what we're aiming at. We're aiming at making disciples. We're aiming at making mature followers of, of Jesus Christ. And that only happens God's way. It doesn't happen with, with our ideas. I, I, one of my prayers for for the body of Christ in the United States of America today is God protect us from clever men. We are getting killed by clever men who think that they're smarter than God with all their ideas and they come up with these ideas and then church after church after church hitch their wagon to these things and they get hijacked for six months, for six years, for 16 years. I say forget these clever cleverness in people and what we need is obedient men and women in the body of Christ and leading in these these kinds of things this also all this strange fire it includes unbiblical practices that are borrowed from pagan religions around the world and of course you've got the whole emergent thing that's happening today which I want to stay away from because it's going to collapse under its own weight in short enough time on things but the borrowing of all this nonsense from all these different places and then trying to sanctify it and and all and goes on all over the place and I think there's this terrible tendency as you look at Nadab and Abihu what's happening here you got a situation where God comes and just does this incredible as I said God thing 
He, he bursts this great miracle. He does this great thing. He gathers his people together. The whole thing is all about him. And then you get two guys that want to rise up and now take what God has birthed, what God has honored and blessed, and they want to hijack it with their own dumb ideas. And it happens all of the time. And, and then this thing gets turned into no longer a work of God. Now it gets turned into you know, a monument to man's uh, cleverness and to his, his talent. And, and so where is that in the Bible? That's a great question to ask concerning these. It's a legitimate question to ask concerning these things. Remember when Paul, Acts 17, 11, Paul um, Went to uh, the uh, from went away from Thessalonica, came uh, to to Berea, and he declared concerning the Bereans that they were. The, Luke declares concerning them that the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because they received the word of God with all readiness of mind, and then they searched the scriptures to see whether these things were so. They wanted a biblical basis for what it is that that uh, Paul was teaching them and and trying to draw them in. To. We are not to be doing a bunch of strange, unbiblical, worldly stuff and then call it worship. It's not to happen in, in a local church or in the body of, of Christ. And what is true of a congregation is true of an individual. Every single one of us began our Christian life as a work of God's Holy Spirit, as a miracle of God's Holy Spirit. And we rejoiced in the day that he did that. And then there's that great tendency to take this great miracle that pleases God and pleased us, and then now to hijack it by our flesh, and now turn our Christian life into something that is fashioned after the world. I'm holy where I want to be holy. I'm like the world where I want to be like the world. Strange fire where I like, holy fire where I like. And it's not to be that way. Not in a church, not in an individual uh, family here. Then lesson number three here on this to me is you look at what Nadab and Abihu are doing here and what is, is such a strong trend even today is you see all of the self-will and people doing as they, as they please as leaders and say, where is, uh, what's behind all of it? And what's behind all of it is a fear of God. Fear of God. Do you fear Him? I fear Him. As God is my witness, I fear Him in my walk with Him. I love Him. I'm so confident in His grace. I'm a testimony to His, his grace. I don't doubt my salvation. I don't doubt that, that He cares about me. I don't doubt any of those things. But I fear ever putting Him in a place where I force Him, I force him to choose between being true to His word... And then doing something good for me, my disobedience. And it's a, it's a healthy thing in my life. I don't want you to go, I, sometimes people talk about it and say, well, the fear of God, it always means reverence. I'm all for that. I say, I have a respect and a reverence for God. And it's great, it includes that, but it includes more than that. It means to fear Him. I don't know what kind of a dad you had. I had a stepdad, and uh, I was certainly not likening him to God, not in any way (laughs) remotely. But one of the things about that thing, I mean, I learned to fear. I learned to respect authority. I learned to think twice before I did something that got attention that I didn't want to have. From, from him and I think that in more healthy relationships it's good to have a, a dad and we have this in a heavenly father who loves us, he cares about us we're sure of these things and all but all the way tucked back in there is that thing don't, don't push him there don't mess with him there stay far away from there and it's good for us Because it keeps us from going places that we shouldn't go. Or if we do go there, it makes us quick to come back. And so the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. I mean, wisdom and all kinds of things from God unfold out of the fear of God. And and it's a good thing to have. They've completely lost the fear of God. Let me give you a good fear of God uh, passage in the New Testament. 
Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Just like Nadab and Abihu. Strong in the grace, man, let's, like Peter said at the end of his, you know, uh, be strong in the grace that is in uh, Christ Jesus, absolutely. But there, it, this Christian life, for healthy, there's that strong in the grace, and then there's great, great respect for God, and then there's even a, a stronger, even a fear of God in this. And it keeps us on the straight and narrow, a healthy balance of things, until we get into heaven where we won't have to worry about any of that stuff, because there won't be a world or a flesh or a devil uh, fighting uh, against, uh, you know, walking with the Lord all the way there. Now notice in verse 2. That is they, they did this self-willed thing, so fire went out from the Lord and devoured them. Wow. You think it got quiet? Man. And everybody's just celebrating and just, wow, too much and everything. And then, boom, these guys are, you know, I mean, it just wipes them out. They're running around with their little sensor and their man-made ideas. And he just fries them right on the spot. And they died before the Lord. God just pours His judgment out upon them. What, that, what does that tell us? It tells us there's something about what these two guys are doing that super displeased God. Really, really displeased Him. And He lets, just as much as He let them know there at the end of chapter 8, that He was pleased with the Aaronic priesthood. In, in the that fire, the second kind of fire, see it's the two kinds of fire. The second kind of fire that he brings forth makes it just as clear before the congregation of Israel that this doesn't please him at, at all. He, he lets everyone know what he thinks about it. And so in one instant, it's amazing to me, God reduces the Aaronic priesthood. There's only five of them. And he reduces it down to three in one instant. Think about what he has invested in establishing the Aaronic priesthood. And all of it a picture of Christ. All the time, all the effort, all the everything. These guys jump up and do this thing. And without blinking, he wipes out almost half of it. Better not put the other three on the same plane, because if it crashes, the whole Aaronic priesthood is gone. But as he looks at this thing... And you think, Lord, you're going to, I mean, you've more than decimated it. You've cut it by half here. And the Lord looks at it and says, if that's the priesthood, then I don't want a priesthood. I don't want to be represented in that kind of way. And, uh, and here we are, right out of the chute, just starting something new. And these guys want to introduce this kind of leaven into the worship of my people, of me. And, and he just brings a, 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 a screeching halt to the whole thing and drives his point home. That's interesting in the Bible. Uh, many, many times, the Lord, when he is launching something new among his people. His people are entering into a new phase in their history with God that very often he would take a situation where you look at it and you say, why would he overlook what, he, what Aaron's calf? Why didn't he kill Aaron? And that's as bad as what these guys did. And, and sometimes God would overlook certain things, but when he was starting a new phase in their history, oftentimes he would come in and re-emphasize his holiness in this way to the people so that going into this new phase, they would realize holiness is really, really important to the Lord. We see it here with Nadab and Abihu. Remember when Joshua has taken the children of Israel, as we'll see, into the promised land? This is a whole new phase in their history. What does Achan do? He takes that stuff, hides it in his tent and the whole thing, and God takes and wipes him out. They're heading into a whole new time in their history, and he judges before the whole nation. Uh, them in order to drive home the importance of holiness. Remember when David, uh, the kingdom, the, north, uh, the, the, the tribes of Israel come together united and then he becomes a king over the whole nation. The very first thing he wanted to do was bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. He, and the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. He wanted to bring God back into the center of their national life. So he calls the priests and says, let's transport that Ark. 
And what do they do? They throw it on a cart and they transport it the way the Philistines transport junk. (laughs) They do it the way the world uh, did things instead of carrying it like they were supposed to. And uh, the the cart, it it, it, it hits a bump and, uh, and then the ark begins to get unsteady. Uzzah reaches out and he steadies the ark of the covenant so that it doesn't fall over. And God smites him right on the spot there. Because here they are, here's a whole new time in their history, their first uh, great king anyway, and David and all, a, a, a new phase in their history, Jerusalem becoming their capital and all, and he, and he drives that point home, and it would take them a considerable length of time before they would figure out what went wrong there, and then transport the, the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem by carrying it. Then you fast forward. Um, 3,000 years into the New Testament, and here's the birth of the church, Acts chapter 5. And uh, all of the people sharing with what they had to take care of one another and everything, Ananias and Sapphira. So it's a new thing. And what do they do? They take, they sell their land, they bring the money to Peter, they give the appearance that they're giving all when they're only giving part. God didn't care if they didn't give any of it, but it's hypocrisy that they're introducing into this new thing called the body of Christ, and God smites them, again, to drive home the importance of holiness during these kind of tra- important transition uh, periods in the work of, of his people. And so this is the same kind of thing. Now notice Moses' statement to Aaron, uh, verse 3, he said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke saying. So uh, Aaron, you've seen what, he just seen his two sons die. So he's wondering what in the world happened here. So God is going to speak through Moses and say, Aaron, here's the moral of the story. Here's what, here's what you're supposed to learn from this, this situation. And and he said, those who come near me, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. Lesson number four. Those who claim to represent God in the world, that's all of us, we're all New Testament priests as Christians, need to have a concern for holiness, and we need to have a regard for the holiness of God. I love the holiness of God. I certainly don't match up to it in in the way that I want to, but I'm growing in it. But I'm so glad that He is working in our lives to bring us up to His level and instead of you know just leaving us the way that we were. But there's to be this respect for holiness, a holy uh, God. And then notice uh, verse 3, And before all of the people I must be glorified. In other words, in our service to the Lord, before all of the people, He's got to be glorified. This, this speaks to our motives. And sometimes people look at this and they say, well, we don't really know what, what Nadab and Abihu did wrong. I, I don't agree with that. Uh, I think God writes the Bible with an intent that it be understood. I think something happens here, and then he elaborates in his own way on what went wrong in this thing so we can learn from it. Somehow, all mixed into their cleverness and their disobedience and their man-made ideas and their rebellion and sin was this desire to be seen by people, this desire to be the center of attention. Here's this great, big, wonderful thing that God is doing. God has shown up in His presence. It's so strong. The people are worshiping Him. What a great chance for me to show off who and what I am. And, and so here is this endeavoring to bring glory uh, to, them, to themselves and uh, a desire to be recognized and glorified uh, by people. And, and so apparently Nadab and Abihu, they wanted to use this occasion to draw attention uh, to themselves. The problem with that is that any glory or recognition that we receive from people always comes at the expense of God. It's always glory and recognition that is due to him. That doesn't mean you can't go up to someone and say, you know, what you said blessed me. Uh, What you did, you sent me that card and you included that verse, and that blessed me. It was just what I needed to hear. Encouragement's a good thing in in the Bible. There's nothing wrong with encouragement. But, but there is this, but, but the Lord, the recognition that the Lord deserves all of 
of the, the, the glory. And, and that's the single great concern that we should have is to glorify Him, bring Him pleasure, and then whatever He wants to do with whatever meeting we're involved in, a home fellowship or whatever it is, then He can do whatever He wants. I think God's people, spiritual people, they come together. You know, you've got this whole I, me, my thing going on and where all the church services are. Let's get a form and find out what do people want and what do people this and people, people and people and people and you and I and me and my and all and I. And, and that's why sometimes in the worship songs where they've got more I, me and my in it, I say, I don't want to sing that song. I want a song full of the Lord. I get enough I, me, my every time I think. <laughs> So I, I want it to be, you know, about him. But everything is so focused on the people, the people, the people, until church is all about people. It's not about people, it's about God, supremely. We come together and we worship him, and whatever he wants to do with that, people that are really spiritual can be happy with that. that that's, what, that's what it's about. And, and, uh, but sometimes people crave, you know, that attention and all. But the Bible says the Lord won't share his glory with man. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name. <laughs> and my glory I will not give to another, uh, nor my praises to graven images. It's an important ministry lesson. And, and none of us are perfect in it. But we are never, ever to compete with God for the attention of his people in anything we're leading in the name of, of the Lord. And, and so that's how we are to do ministry. Now notice Aaron's response to all this. He held his peace. He held his peace. And, uh, and I don't think he held his peace grudgingly or anything like that. Things are starting to fill in the blank for him a little bit on what it is that, that is, has happened um, here. What Nadab and Abihu were doing here, very dangerous. The first day of the public official launching of the Old Testament priesthood, and they introduce all this leaven into it. And if God had not made a strong stand against it, then that's just going to permeate out into the people and would just start to characterize the worship of God. The nation would end up being lost. Messiah is tied to that nation. Jesus coming in to the world. Big time serious what they were doing here. And, and I think that Aaron is figuring that out, you know, by the sentence at this point in, in things. So he held his peace. And then Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, uh, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron. So uh, Aaron's cousins. And he said to them, come near, carry your brethren uh, from before the sanctuary out of, of the camp. And uh, so they went near, they carried them by their tunics, they didn't want to touch their bodies, so they did it by their tunics, carried them out of the camp, as Moses had said. So he doesn't even say, take them out of the area of the tabernacle, he says, take them out of the camp. What did they take out of the camp? Sin offering? Uh, things associated with rebellion? He said, take them all the way out of the camp as a demonstration of the fact that we don't want this influence and in, in what we're about is a holy people. And then Moses said to Aaron and to Eliezer and Ithamar, his two remaining sons, Do not uncover your heads, nor tear your clothes, lest you die and wrath come upon all the people. He tells them here, they, and, and, uh, and he's going to tell them in a moment, because they're bearing the anointing oil, the anointing of, of the Holy Spirit upon their lives. They are representing God at this moment. Very difficult time in Aaron's life to stay faithful to representing God properly. But Moses comes to him, and it's a very, very loving thing to do. And he said, don't you take your hood off. Don't put dirt in your hair. Don't rend your garments. Don't you begin to mourn for your sons in any kind of a way that reflects badly upon God. Don't do anything that would communicate to the people that God has done something harsh or unrighteous here in what he's, he's done or that you disagree with it in any way because what God had done here was completely righteous and necessary. But he warns them. In, in our ministry as New Testament priests, the highest mantle that we wear in life is representing the Lord. 
That's the most, the, our, our relationship with the Lord is the most important relationship in our life. Now that will make every other good relationship in our life better. No human relationship ever, it, 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 there's never an expense against it on the basis of us walking close with the Lord and, and loving Him with all of our heart, our, our mind, our soul, and our, our strength. But we represent the Lord first and foremost in, in life, even above all other things. And our great concern is, I do not want to misrepresent God as being unrighteous or having done wrong here, or that I disagree with Him, even if it means I have to kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, step back a little bit and subdue myself in a particular environment in, in what God has done to someone that's close in my family. And, and that's a real thing that's important in, in ministry and our service to the Lord. Sometimes I've, I've seen situations, not very often, but you have a Christian who doesn't understand this aspect of, of being a New Testament priest. And, and something happens in life, they don't agree with it, they think God has been unrighteous concerning it, and they blame God, they get bitter against God, they say all kinds of things against God, even in front of people that don't believe or anything like that. And I mean, they misrepresent Him in a terrible, terrible way because they're elevating this other relationship above the relationship with God and representing Him properly. And it's the wrong thing to do. I mean, we understand the temptation. They had a great temptation here. But Moses said, don't give in to it. You're representing God first and foremost in this world. You represent Him. And don't make it appear as if He's done something wrong here when He hasn't done anything wrong at all. Let your brethren, let them mourn, the whole house of Israel. Let them bewail uh, the burning which the Lord has kindled. But you can't do it. You're priests. And you shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die, for the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. They are, they are obeying Him. And, and obeying God's counsel here. And then the Lord spoke to Aaron. It's the only place in the whole Bible that, God, that we have a record that God spoke directly to Aaron himself. And this is what he said. He said, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink, uh, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die uh, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that you may distinguish between holy and unholy, between clean and un, uh, unclean and clean, and that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. Lesson number six in, in all of this. The priests, were, as priests, we are not to conduct our lives or our ministries under any other influence than the Holy Spirit. And certainly not under the influence of, of alcohol or anything like that. All of our ministry that we do is to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. They were not under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And he gives the reason for it there in verse 10, because it impairs our judgment between what is holy and what is unholy, what is clean and what is unclean. So being under the influence of anything other then the Holy Spirit can lead us to do something stupid or something that's inappropriate that can disqualify us from ministry. I mean, they did something that was stunningly stupid and, and inappropriate. And it happens if we come under the influence of something other than the Holy Spirit. New Testament verses related to this famous one, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Do not be drunk with wine wherein is excess, uh, but be being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's to be the great influence in our life, the Holy Spirit. Proverbs chapter 31 Verses 4 and 5, uh, Solomon writes and says, It is not for kings, uh, 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 O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes, that is, leaders, intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice of the afflicted. Now, the Bible uh, doesn't say that a person can't have 
a, a glass of wine. A person is not to come under the influence of, of alcohol that is, or, or drugs or anything like that. Uh, that's always forbidden. And I think as a, as a pastor in this culture, it's very prudent to stay away from alcohol altogether because of how it's viewed. Um, you walk, somebody, a pastor could have the freedom to have wine or to have a glass of beer or something like that in a restaurant, but then, you know, here comes uh, Mr. and Mrs. So and so with their five little children and they walk in and, was that Pastor Damien having a brewski there at the, you know, Shakey's? Uh, kind of a, think it, they think going to create a little problem for them, you know, at, at home? Yeah, you know, there's liberty. Let me show you the verses and the whole, nah, liberty schmiberty. I don't get that. He shouldn't be doing that out there. Like, so the way, just the way the culture deals with it, I think it's people the best for leaders to steer uh, clear of it, even if there isn't uh, drunkenness involved. And so he makes this as a, uh, a statute forever uh, uh, to them. And then it is really beautiful in verse 12. We're going to get through this. You just relax. We're going to do that. And, uh, uh, and then Moses does something beautiful. Verse 12. He spoke to Aaron and Eliezer and Ithamar, his sons who were left. He said, take the, uh, off- the grain offering that remains of the offerings made by fire to the Lord. Eat it without leaven beside the altar, for it is most holy. You shall eat it in a holy place because it's, it's your due and your son's due for the sacrifices made by fire to the Lord. So, for so I have uh, been commanded. The breast of the wave offering, the thigh of the heave offering, you shall eat in a clean place. You, your sons, and your daughters with you, for they are your due and your sons' due, which are given from the sacrifices of peace offerings of the children of Israel. The thigh of the heave offering and the breast of the wave offering, they shall bring with the offerings of fat made by fire to offer as a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be yours and your sons with you uh, by a statute forever, as the Lord has commanded. In other words, he does something, it's, it's fabulous, and the Lord does it all the time. Here he is, he's in the middle of this experience that's got to be very, very disorienting for him. And Moses comes on the scene and basically says, all right, let's move forward. Let's move forward in your calling. You've got a calling on your life. God's called you to be something in the history of his people. And this is a very difficult season and difficult situation. But you don't get to quit because of this. You move on in your calling and in your anointing. And I think not only was it a strong um, thing to keep someone from quitting or saying, wow, this is way too much for me. I, if this is, I, I don't know that I can handle all these things that can come up in a person's mind. He says, you just get on with your calling and, and move forward from this. You're never going to forget it. But you move on in your calling. I think the second thing that this would have done for Moses is it would have been, a, or for Aaron, is it would have been a great encouragement to him that God wasn't through with him. You're still the high priest. You still have this calling on your life. You still need to do this. And what your sons did was a reflection on them, but it is not a reflection upon you. And, and so God is still with you. God has still uh, called you to do this. Now you need to be faithful to do it. And one of the great things uh, in, in terms of a crisis like this that hits, we're disoriented. Where do I, can I go? What do I do? And all of that is to just keep my hands on the plow and keep me moving forward in God's call upon our lives. It's the only safe place uh, in, in a time where uh, this bad decisions can be made so so easily. And then Moses, verse 16, made careful inquiry uh, about the goat of the sin offering. And there it was, burned up. And he was angry with Eleazar and Ithamar, the souls of uh, sons of Aaron, who were left, saying, Why did you not eat the sin offering in the holy place, since it is most holy, and God has given it to you to bear the guilt of the congregation to make atonement uh, for, uh, for them before the Lord? See, its blood was not brought inside the holy place because you should have eaten it in the holy place as I commanded. Here's the problem. They had a sin offering that they were offering on behalf of the people. When they offered a sin offering for their own sin, uh, they they didn't get a portion of that sin offering. But when the people would, an an offering of a goat would be offered for a sin offering for the people, a portion of that goat became theirs for them to eat. They were to go in the precincts of the temple and they were to eat that portion of that animal uh, within eyeshot of 
of the people and what it was communicating to the people as they would eat that portion of the animal is that God has accepted your offering. They were representing God in that. So here what they do is, then this is, everybody knows this, but what they did instead of eating their portion is they took this sin offering and they put it on, on the burnt altar and they burned the whole thing up just like a burnt offering. And Moses comes along and says, this is just open disobedience to what God... You already see what disobedience has done today. And then why are you doing the wrong thing here? And, and the Bible says he gets angry. And I've heard people talk about... Now Moses, he's going to get in trouble because of, of anger ultimately in his life. But I don't think this is an unrighteous anger. It's like we've all seen what has happened today. We don't want to lose... You know, two more of you uh, on, on this today. So you need to handle these sacrifices properly. And, and that's what he's, he's dealing with here. So he, he exhorts them. And then Aaron, the father, he, he gives an explanation to Moses. And, and he said, look, this day uh, they have offered their sin offerings and their burnt offerings before the Lord. And such things have befallen me. I mean, we did this and then my two sons have died. He said, if I had eaten the sin offering today, would it have been accepted in the sight of the Lord? He said, in, in essence, to Moses, he said, I, the, the, after what happened there... I couldn't be confident to do anything and, and understand that God would accept it. Now, he, now he's wrong in that if, he, if they had just done what God said, that's always the safe place in life. But, but he's looking at that and he just says, you know, I, I, for a little while here, I, I couldn't see up from down on it. And I thought, if I ate the sin offering, not knowing that my sons were stricken because of their own sin and not a sin that was broader within the priesthood or anything, so we didn't eat that. And, and when Moses heard it, uh, he was content with the explanation. If the worship team had come forward, that'd be great. And we just have a few minutes left here. But I want to close with a little bit of time uh, spent here in, in worship before we before we leave this um, yeah, tonight and leave this section of Scripture. So, not a popular subject today, the holiness of God, is it? There isn't. So important. That's the theme of the book of Leviticus. It's holiness. Because it, all the way through his book he says, Be holy, for I am holy. To be a holy people in this world. That means to be Christ-like. He's, he is the definition of holiness, isn't he? I just want to challenge us tonight. We're New Testament priests. The twofold function. I, I, I exhort myself. Twofold function of the priest in the Old Testament was to represent God before the people. That's what you'll do at work tomorrow. That's what you'll do at school tomorrow. That's what you'll do in your neighborhood tomorrow. That's what we're going to do. We're going to represent God before this world. And then number two, to represent the people before God in intercession. That, that's a calling on every single one of our lives. So this is like some theoretical thing and, and uh, that you know I kind of got six points out of and slowed down and going through the scriptures related to it. These are important applications for our own life. Are you a holy person? Are you holy tonight? And I know when I ask a question like that, I'm not trying to beat anybody up. Believe me, I love you. you I love you. But it's, it's the question that the passage asks of, of us. Are you a holy person tonight? And, and when you ask a question like that, if a person isn't in a place of holiness with God, we immediately would be able to say no, but we would immediately know why we're not. Immediately there would be that one, two, three, five things that we'd look at, at and say, no, my, that isn't holy in my life. And, and those are the kind of things we want to spend a couple minutes here as we close in, in worship and just get that right with God. It's easy to talk about Nadab and Abihu and this and that, but what about our own lives tonight? I don't want to beat anybody up, don't want to condemn anybody, but it's just a great time for us to just sit and say, I want to be a holy person, a holy priest, and then just turn, repent of anything that I need to, to God tonight, 
in, in order to do that, confess it as sin, so we can all go out those back doors, rushing wherever we're going to rush, and know I'm set to be a New Testament priest for the Lord when I get home to that unsaved husband or wife or into the neighborhood or into whatever tomorrow and all of these things. And so let's just settle that issue related to our, our own lives uh, and, and just to rejoice in and and just praise the Lord and consider for holiness and to consider holiness a great gift and a great honor in an unholy world. It's